Welcome to another episode of The Watchdog with me, Loki, here on Mint Press, where we are challenging the elite narratives in our society and pushing back on the mythology that they use to retain their power over us. We have a very interesting episode today with an academic and somebody who has over the last decade or so, become quite a high-ranking enemy of the Zionist movement, not only in this country. We are, of course, talking about somebody who great expense has been set aside to demonize um, with, you know, tens at least of articles published in some of the biggest newspapers in this country to convince you that this person has irrational views uh, specifically pertaining to Palestine, that his body of work that he has literally built up in an encyclopedic way over these many years is somehow discredited um, because of an irrationality which they argue is key to his view. The website that he was a key part of, um, Powerbase, provides a real um, treasure trove and wealth of information about the way power operates. It allows us to look deep within the inner workings of some of the most important uh, lobby groups and think tanks in the world. I am talking about uh, Professor David Miller. David, how are you? Thank you for joining us. I'm very well, thank you. So today we are going to talk about a bit about your background as well, so we can take the conversation out of where the those who are trying to silence you have sort of forced it, so we can understand your work on Palestine in the context of the rest of your work that you spent decades doing before this uh, this uh, sort of controversy has been manufactured around you. But first, I think it's important to understand, you know, for the better part of a decade or more, you have been a target of the um, Israel lobby in this country. But in the last few years, it has... Um, escalated significantly. If you can just tell us about the sort of that trajectory, but then also what you are facing now and what you are trying to do in, 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 uh, in terms of pushing back on this campaign. That's a big question. Um, let me, let me start by saying that, um, I first got accused of being an anti-Semite around about 2009 as a result of having done work on uh, the neoconservative movement in, in Europe, so in European countries, in addition to the neoconservative movement in the US, which of course is where it originated. Uh, and uh, the, the criticisms spurred me really to look in more depth at Zionism. I hadn't understood why I was being called an anti-Semite. And so I started to investigate the Zionist movement itself, and we produced and, and just as a question, where did that first sort of accusation come from at that time? When it you were it came at from uh, a set of um, websites and blogs which were associated with neoconservative think tanks uh, and with the counter-extremism industry funded by the government. So wow. both government-funded and Zionist-related organizations mm. were the ones who started to do that. Uh, and... That, that's what spurred me into doing more research directly on the Zionist movement. I'd never done research on the Zionist movement, didn't think of it as being a, a, a key area of research. But uh, and to be clear, you'd been an academic for decades at that point. Yeah, not that old, but yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my research background is in propaganda. I started by doing a PhD on propaganda in the case of the north of Ireland. I uh, did a lot of uh, interviews and uh, research in London and in, in Belfast and Derry with all the participants in the conflict. Um, uh, and, be, and as a result of that, became very interested in the whole question of propaganda. And I went on from that to do work on propaganda and lobbying 
in relation to uh, a whole range of areas in relation to health and science. I wrote, wrote a book on HIV and AIDS, on, I did work on food, uh, and did work all, also, of course, after 9-11 on Afghanistan, on Iraq, uh, on uh, British propaganda in those situations. So I had a long history of doing work on propaganda. And so it was clear to me when I started to be attacked uh, as an anti-Semite that there was, there was some forces at work behind this, and I wanted to understand what they were. So we started to do work explicitly on Zionism. So we, in particular, by 2013, we'd started to do work on uh, a, a pro-Israel uh, PR agency called BICOM, the Britain-Israel Communications and Research Center. And it was that which opened my eyes, really, to the, the role of the Israel lobby uh, in the UK and more widely internationally. And that, of course, led to more attacks on us. Uh, uh, and uh, f then subsequently, and this is the key, the step, next step that we made, subsequently we did work on uh, one of the key Islamophobic think tanks, which is called the Henry Jackson Society, perhaps the leading one in the UK. And one of the, f the findings in that research was that we compiled, as best we could, because it's largely secretive, uh, the key funders of the Henry Jackson Society. And when we looked at the list of funders, ranking them by those who had given the most, 12 of the top 13 turned out to be foundations created by uh, Zionists. And these are Zionist family foundations, which were funding this neoconservative Islamophobic think tank. Of all the think tanks which are close to the Israelis um, and directly involved um, with significant power players in the Israel lobby, um, the Henry Jackson Society actually wears that association quite thinly. It doesn't wear it very visibly. Um, can you, number one, just state to us, how is the Henry Jackson? You know, because many of us that grew up in the war um, on terror era would always remember tuning into the BBC on a Sunday morning and seeing this... Um, Oddly abrasive, uh, well-spoken, and articulate advocate of the worst aspects of U.S. foreign policy, mm. Douglas Murray. We wouldn't necessarily know that Murray was a key scriptwriter for people employed at the BBC at the time. Mm. We wouldn't necessarily know the weight that uh, Douglas Murray represented. We just saw this person who was presented as an expert on these subjects and clearly was was uh, was furious at Muslims. Now explain to us in a more concrete way what are the policies that the Henry Jackson Society was involved in backing and how those policies affected not only Muslims in other countries but also Muslims here specifically. You know, I'm thinking along the line of the student rights stuff and yeah, so so the Henry Jackson Society is a neoconservative think tank, uh, and uh, as I said, we discovered that most of the key funders that we were able to uncover were were Zionist foundations, That's, you know, pr private charities set up by wealthy Zionist individuals, and, th and that indicated to us what what the political agenda here was. And, and Henry Jackson is opaque about who funds it; it doesn't it, list its it own funders. We had to go and look through the other side. Through, we had to go and look at the uh, report, annual reports and accounts declared to the Charity Commission by these obscure bodies, which we didn't have any real idea about at the time, but we now know a yeah. lot more about. So we, we, we ranked all these foundations. We didn't understand these were Zionist foundations. We just found these foundations named after particular individuals or families. And it was only when we investigated them that we discovered that they, they were also, for example, almost, almost all of them, giving money directly to the settlements in the occupied uh, Palestine uh, and or to the IDF, to the Israel Defense Forces. So there was a, a clear clear indication here that this was a, actually a pro-Israel lobby group effectively, uh, although it didn't seem like that from the outside. So essentially what we have here is looking at the neocons and understanding the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan then leads you to look at Islamophobia. Yeah. Then looking at Islamophobia actually leads you, you know, this is, documented facts. So if you could just break down for us um, the five pillars of Islamophobia that you and others identify in the very, very important book, What is Islamophobia? Uh, Social Movements from Above, that I 
highly, highly recommend to anyone watching it. It changed my whole conception of, of Islamophobia, actually. And also, you know, one of the chapters in there, for instance, the Sarah Marusek chapter, makes clear that according to the research that uh, you looked at, you're looking at 75% of the organizations that fund Islamophobic organizations also fund the building of illegal settlements in the West Bank. So this is a material reality of what you're saying. When you're saying the Zionist movement is involved in Islamophobia, is a part of the Islamophobia industry, this is clearly easily verifiable, not easily, but verifiable. Fact. Verifiable, yes. And, and it, it, we didn't anticipate, we weren't looking for this. We looked for where the money came from yeah. and this fell in our lap. And then we had to understand that. So what we then did was we tried to understand, well, how is it that, that Islamophobic ideas in particular about Muslims being extremists or, quote, fundamentalists or Islamists uh, 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 came, came about? Where did they come from? What policies in relation to this, this notion of extremism uh, were being proposed by whom, and so we we came up with this model, which we called, you know, in, in a nod to uh, uh, to uh, Islamic belief, the five pillars of Islamophobia. And look, we said that the most important pillar, the backbone of Islamophobia, is the counterterrorism apparatus of the state. So that's the police, the Home Office, the intelligence services, uh, and uh, and the, the associated apparatus in in the public sector, uh, and that, that's that's the apparatus which on a daily basis, discriminates against Muslims. So this is a key part of the analysis because the ready-made version of Islamophobia that we are given, often through an institution like the BBC, is that the state is the neutral arbiter sure. in something that exists within people, within That's the right. society. That's right. But what this analysis that you're speaking about does is it directly places the state as the key uh, pusher of it's, this form it's of racism. state led racism that's right yes. uh, and uh, and you know it's when muslims come in and out of the country when they're stopped at st pancras station in london for example under the terrorism act these are direct discriminations against muslims these are discriminations which don't happen against jews they don't happen against white people uh, they yes they sometimes ha have happened especially in the past against irish catholics but the, but the people who are the, the main target of these uh, these depredations by the state are Muslims, and so we said that's the that's the backbone, right? But the the policies which allow these discriminations to happen are put in place as a result of a policy process. And it, since the war on terror, those policies have uh, have ramped up and ramped up, and they've been pushed for the the notion of extremism that we don't we're not just interested in in countering terrorism, we're interested in countering bad ideas about violence or extremist ideas which might be non-violent. And all of these developments in counterterrorism policy have been pushed for by a co coalition of interests and groups. And so what we do is we try and divide these up into different specific domains. And we start off by saying, look, of course, the far right is an important actor in this. And we, by this we mean that, yes, the traditional fascist right, but then the new more Islamophobic groups, the English Defence League and all the groups which came after them, that's, a, that's an important element. That's one of the pillars we say. But there are also are, is the neoconservative movement, which is a, a movement which is much more elite, which it operates at the level of Whitehall, Westminster, through think tanks, is not, doesn't have a street army, uh, and it's the, ones, it's the one which has been pushing forward these ideas about extremism in particular, which then the EDL works with in the streets. Uh, so that's two. That's that's that's, the, that's three altogether. The, yeah. the far right, the neoconservative movement, the counterterrorism apparatus, and then we had two more. One is is a, a various groups on the left who who are secularist, parts of the pro-war left, who tend to be uh, uh, anti-Muslim and to to push forward ideas about about uh, Muslim extremism. Am I not wrong though in remembering the book to also identify the media? in terms of astroturfing some of these ideas. So for instance, you have the David Blunkett uh, situation with Abu Hamza where the Sun um, does a petition in order, it organizes a letter writing campaign, either the Sun or the Daily Mail, to demand the deportation of a particular uh, sure. bogey man at the time. And so it kind of is this symbiotic way that the state and the media would work together for the state to for to supposedly be pushed in directions that it already had shown 
uh, indications it wanted to go, but the media was used to kind of push it more in that way. I, I do remember Murdoch media and, and that, that kind of um, ecosystem being identified more in the analysis as well. No, was, no, no. So what we would say is that mm. the media are not one of the right. front, uh, one of the pillars. That the media are uh, at, at the level of, the, of involvement in those debates. As, mm. as you say, there's a, there's a a sort of there's a kind of theatre mm. where it looks like the government's being pushed by the media. No, the media are subservient to the right. the dominant classes and the dominant right. uh, structures. In mm. this case, subservient to the counterterrorism apparatus, to the intelligence services. Right. You know, right. there are there are you know there are many. Journalists who have uh, who have regular briefings from MI6 and MI5. Of course, we we know uh, from leaked documents, don't we? In the last few years, for example, the le the left wing journalist Paul Mason actually mm. an agent of MI6, as as documents have revealed. Mm. Uh, so, so of course, there are structural relationships between the intelligence services, the special branch, the police, the Home Office, the Foreign Office, Number Ten, and journalists, which means yeah. that they are the ones who push out state-led views, first yeah. of all, but they also push out the views of, of some of the other social movements, like the, the, neo neocons the neocons in the, particular, yeah. who focus on policy, push their views out through the media, uh, in, in a way which, where, for example, the far right is much less good at, and the far right quite often will True. get some negative co coverage, in a way that the neocons hardly, hardly ever do. Sometimes they do, but hardly ever. So that mm. that that we would see the media as being subordinate. In right. fact, more recently, I've uh, in the last year or so, I, I wrote a big piece about this uh, about the media, and mm. in in uh, I think five different European countries showed that the intelligence services are the dominant sources in France, in the UK, uh, I think in Spain as well, uh, I, I, with only one exception uh, of, of Italy for various reasons we won't go into. It. But the, the 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 dominant sources in the media on these issues. Are always the counterterrorism apparatus of the state, with, with right. subsidiary sources being the neocons in particular. So that mm -hmm. there, there we are. So we've got the four four um, pillars. The fifth pillar, which uh, is which is the one which is I, I guess seems to have caused all the trouble, is the is parts of the Zionist movement. And the reason we said parts of the Zionist movement, I've already said the reason for this. When we looked at the the, the Henry Jackson Society, we discovered that of the top thirteen funders. Twelve of them ended up were Zionist foundations, which also give to to the to the occupation of Palestine, to to ethnic cleansing of Palestine. So we we said parts of the Zionist movement. At that stage, we we were we were simply being driven by the empirical research which we'd done. And now what happened was that I, I gave a lecture on the five pillars uh, just after I had got a job at uh, the University of Bristol, which I started in, in late two thousand eighteen. In February two thousand nineteen, I gave a, a lecture. On this five pillars, and it's a two-hour lecture. There's videos and stuff we show, and uh, probably I spent about five minutes talking about the parts of the Zionist movement as being, you know, uh, having a uh, being impl implicated in this. And in fact, you, if you want to know exactly what I said, the the covert recording of my lecture was leaked to the Jewish News some uh, months later, so you can hear exactly what I said. Uh, um, uh, and, to the newspaper, the newspaper that is calls itself the, the Jewish, Jewish News. That's yeah. right, yeah. So, yeah, so, um, so I did this lecture, and in the course of the lecture, there's a few minutes on parts of the Zionist movement, and then there were apparently two students uh, complained to an organization called the Community Security Trust. Uh, We've not got enough time to talk enough about the Community Security Trust, but this is an organization which is set up, a charity, to defend Jews against anti-Semitism. But it, it has, since, it's, since the beginning, tried to blur the distinction between anti-Semitism as a form of racism against Jews as Jews, and anti-Zionism, i.e. criticism of Israel. It, it, it simply is unable, it's unwilling to make that distinction. Uh, and as a result, it, it, uh, it made a complaint to the University of Bristol, where I worked, and the University of Bristol rejected the complaint because the CST is not a student. And under the student complaints policy, you've got to be a student to make a complaint. So the CST then approached the London-based Union of Jewish Students and the president there, a woman called Hannah Rose, the sister of Ella Rose, who uh, some of you might remember, your viewers might remember, uh, was involved in the, uh, the Al Jazeera program on the Israel lobby. And she then approached the president of the JSOC, the Jewish Society at the University of Bristol, and the two two of them signed a letter of complaint about me. Now, before we go on to talk about that complaint, 
Um, the, the, the Union of Jewish Students is, of course, a Zionist organization. And, and uh, when I say it, it's, of course, a Zionist organization, what I mean is it's part of the World <coughs> Union of Jewish Students, which is directly affiliated to the World Zionist organization. And you know, as a result, it's part of that whole movement. And, and also it works directly with the Israeli lobby, with the Israel lobby, with the Israeli embassy. And gets funding from it, yes. And gets it, but also more than that, the, and gets funding from it, as was revealed in the Al Jazeera yeah. uh, documentary. Sure. So these two um, uh, people made a complaint to the university. The university couldn't accept a complaint from the president of the Union of Jewish Students because she wasn't a student at Bristol, but they could accept a complaint from the president of the Jewish Society at Bristol. But... This person had never been my student, had never talked to anyone who'd been to any of my lectures, had never been to any of my lectures, but nevertheless, it was accepted that they, that she could make a complaint. And that complaint was 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 filed in, I think, April 2019. And there was an elaborate process, which would then went on up until the end of 2020. So that's a year, over a year and a half, that process went on. Now, let me tell you briefly what happened there. Briefly, what happened was that the the faculty judged the complaint, found it to be uh, um, uh, not justified, rejected the complaint. The student then uh, appealed. The university said, uh, the student appealed and said, "You not you haven't used this. You haven't used the IHRA definition, the International Holocaust Alliance, uh, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition, working definition of anti-Semitism." And the university said, "Well, no, we haven't adopted that." Uh, and she said she she made a complaint about that, and so the university said to her, "Why don't you, you know, just st stall your complaint for just for a while? In a few months' time, the university will decide whether it's going to introduce the IHRA definition." So she said, "Yeah, okay, I'll pause the complaint." A few months later, at the end of the year, the university had introduced the IHRA after being lobbied by the Zionist organisation that she represented, uh, and in January, the university then appointed a QC for outside the university um, to investigate me, to investigate various things I'd said, all the things that they'd, they'd complained about. And of course, the many of the things that they complained about ha should have been struck out of the complaint because they were made before I even started at the University of Bristol. And the complaints procedure show, says within 90 days, you've got to complain within 90 days. So only, uh, so in fact, only one of the statements they complained about had been made since I started at Bristol, and none of them had been, been made within the limits. So the whole thing should have been rejected before it was it was investigated. Anyhow, they investigated that QC investigated it for some eleven months through COVID and lockdown. And uh, at the end of twenty twenty, the QC concluded that there wasn't a single sentence, word, or or comma which I had ever said which was anti-Semitic. So I was given a complete. Bill, bill of clean, bill of clean, of health, right? And the and the, and and the university wrote to me and said, "Nothing to say here. You didn't do anything wrong. This complaint was manifestly ridiculous." Uh, um, and as a result of that, um, I, I thought, "Well, that's okay then. You know, fine." I tried to get the university to tell to tell people I'd been found not guilty of anti-Semitism because all the way through this pe period, I was being traduced and defamed and libelled by the press. But the university wouldn't. Uh, they said they were considering publishing the report or a version of the report, but they, they didn't. Uh, and two two months after this, no, six weeks after this, I, I went on a, 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 a Labour Against the Witch Hunt um, political meeting on a Saturday afternoon outside work to talk about what had happened to me. And I talked in general about the academic uh, situation, about Zionists attacking uh, pro-Palestinian activists, and I, I mentioned very briefly my own case, and I said, as some of you will know, I have been uh, attacked and complained about by the president of the Union of Jewish Students and by the president of the Jewish Society at Bristol University, uh, and of course these are Zionist organizations, and that's, those are the words that I, I, I used, I attacked and complained about, and that effectively were the words which resulted in me, in the end, being sacked, right? Because I'd, I'd mentioned that factually that I had been attacked and complained about, which of course I had, and I'd been found not, not guilty of all such complaints. And so that then what was unleashed was this huge deluge of, uh, of complaints and howls of outrage and pearl clutching from 
uh, from the media, from uh, from Zionist organisations, from Parliament, uh, more than a hundred members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons wrote demanding I be sacked. Yeah, direct government uh, intervention, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I mean, huge, ma massive intervention. And indeed, of course, as we subsequently learned, <coughs> there were all sorts of uh, complaints made directly to the university by a whole range of groups, including government organisations, uh, political representatives, Zionist organisations, and indeed some of the, the university's own funders were threatening to withdraw funding if they didn't sack me. And this brings up quite an interesting question because um, what later came to light is that Gerald Ronson, who is the founder and head of the Community Security Trust, is actually listed on the funders of Bristol University. This is the first organization that complained about you. And then the organization that was involved with the organization in the university lobbying against you. Yeah. Um, what was his, uh, his funder designation, I think, was the vice chancellor's circle, yes. which meant somebody that had given enough money to have a straight line of communication, really, with the vice chancellor of uh, Bristol University. Um, so what's happening now with this case, David? What, what, what are you now trying to push back on uh, specifically about this? Because also, you know, as you say, it seems that this routine has successfully played out in pushing others out of academia. Mm. There's the case of someone like Shahad Abu Salama, who obviously the, the initial um, allegation is found to be false. But then in the aftermath of that allegation being found false, there's either a technicality that sure. they are able to then lobby the university on to push that person out, or they cause so much of a fuss. And like in your case, you were, and we must say this explicitly, David Miller was not pushed out, fired from Bristol University. He did not lose his job officially because of anti-Semitism. He was given a clean bill of health. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, what happened was that, I mean, just to bring the story up to, to yeah. today, is that the university then um, appointed a QC to do another report on me, yeah. which also found that I was not guilty of anti-Semitism. But the university decided that, that that wasn't relevant, that what was relevant was not the words I'd said or the views that I held, but the way in which I'd expressed myself, yeah. the, the way I had used the words. They never said, what way I'd used the words, which was a problematic, yeah. but that's that's the reason that they said they'd sack me. So I then I then took that to the university appeal process, where a three person panel uh, heard my case again in uh, early 2022, and that confirmed that I had been sacked. And now we're in the stage where I am taking the university to industrial tribunal, which means that there will be a, a hearing in the court in Bristol, starting on October the 16th uh, and lasting for about two weeks, where all the evidence will be given. Uh, I will be cross-examined. The university's witnesses will be cross-examined. There are something like 5,000 pages of evidence, plus the kind of uh, the, the pleadings, as they're called, my case against the university, the un university's grounds of resistance to that. And that, that will start on the 16th of October. And that's when we will determine whether I've been wrongly dismissed, first of all, um, but secondly, and this is the most important point about the whole case, secondly, the, the case I'm making is that I've been discriminated against on the grounds of my anti-Zionist views. That, it, that if I'd had different views which were controversial, that I wouldn't have been sacked. That uh, it was because that my views were anti-Zionist that the university uh, decided to get itself in the position where it would fire me. Um, one of the key things we're doing is we're trying to say that, that anti-Zionist views should be protected under the Equality Act. Uh, as, many, as 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 uh, a number of cases recently have shown, there are key, there are not, there are key areas where political views should not be used to have people sacked, and, and we're hoping to establish that for anti-Zionist views, which would be uh, a significant achievement, and it would be very difficult to sack people who are, who are supportive of Palestine in the future. Fantastic, and uh, can you also just break down for us some of the work? you did that precedes 
um, the work on the Israel lobby. So specifically, you've pointed out the work on neocons, you've pointed out the work on the Islamophobia industry. But for instance, Powerbase, um, what is that website? Um, and uh, how did it happen? And what does it do? Let me take you on a, a little story, a little journey to get to that. So I, I started my academic career doing uh, a PhD on the north of Ireland, on the propaganda war in relation to the conflict in the north of Ireland, where I interviewed people uh, from all parts of the conflict, including the RUC, the North Ireland Office, the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defence, uh, and also the, the participants in the conflict, people from the Republican movement, and indeed from uh, loyalist paramilitary organisations. Uh, and I, I got an, uh, I got from that an interest in propaganda. I, I started to see, I'd started off by doing media coverage, but I started in the process of doing the research to understand and to discover that propaganda was the more important topic. That it's propaganda which manipulates media. It's not, media might manipulate people's views and understandings and beliefs, but the, the forces that stand behind the media are the propagandists. They're the ones who supply most of the, most of the information to the, to the media, in particular official sources from the government, intelligence services, etc. So I started to do research on propaganda, and over the next decade, two decades, did research on health and science and propaganda, uh, and then after 9-11, uh, did work on Afghanistan, uh, on propaganda in relation to Iraq, published a book on Iraq in 2003, uh, and, uh, and then started to do, more laterally, work on Islamophobia, and that took me to, to, to work on Zionism. So I've done a lot of work on, uh, on propaganda. Now, the, the way that Powerbase came about was that I, in the late 90s, I was uh, working at Stirling University. I'm doing research on, on lobbying. And there were many lobbying scandals uh, associated in particular with the, the end of the Tory government under John Major and the beginning of, of Blairism, of New Labour. And, uh, new Labour bring, brings with it this idea that there would be a new politics, but of course there were still the same old lobbying scandals. And I, I started to do lots of research on lobbying and, and, and corruption. And we, we gave evidence in, to, in the Scottish Parliament saying that lobbyists should be forced to disclose their clients, their budgets, etc. And the Scottish Parliament agreed with us, and they were about to introduce uh, a, um, a, a new measure to force lobbyists to disclose their their uh, clients and their budgets when the election of 2003, I think, happened and a new committee was set up and that and the, the policy went into abeyance. The, it didn't happen again for another few years. But so I realized from that that, that if, you, if you are an academic doing research on issues of public corruption, like lobbying, uh, which is, of course, associated with propaganda, that you, you couldn't get that on the political agenda and sustain it unless you had a campaigning organization which would do that. And so we set up this organization called Public Interest Investigations, which set up two websites, Spinwatch, uh, which lobbied uh, for, uh, for lobbying regulation, and then also, as a, as a kind of research backup for Spinwatch, uh, a, a website which is called Powerbase. And it's a wiki-style website where we profile uh, actors involved in the political process, meaning individuals, but also organizations, lobbyists, propaganda organizations, think tanks, whole series of, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of pages on it now. And that was a, an attempt for uh, by us to bring transparency to the political process and say, look, there's all this covert lobbying going on, but we can research these organizations and we can put it on the web and people will be able to find it on Google. And this is before, of course, the days of the algorithm down ranking it, it meant that you could get you could get right to the top of Google rankings really quite easily, and that, and that was the, that was the, that was the point of it. I mean, it still does rank seemingly quite high with some specific uh, searches, and obviously, Project Owl was something implemented by Google in uh, 2017 2018, which down ranked yeah. uh, stuff that was anti war and critical of uh, U.S. imperialism, of course. Um, and so you also mentioned before that you didn't done some work on HIV. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about that as well, please? So uh, in this period, uh, I guess this is the late 80s to the late 90s, I, I did quite a lot of work on the way in which um, uh, propaganda organizations and lobbyists would try and influence the political agenda. 
in relation to issues like HIV and AIDS, but also in relation to, to food policy, uh, uh, in relation to health, uh, the healthcare system. Uh, and uh, that, that, that was an attempt to try and show that that uh, it was possible to understand why it was that we had particular policies and uh, and how it was that you could, in the end, campaign against um, conservative policies uh, in an effective way. So it was an attempt to try and understand how policy was made to try and intervene in it. Mm -hmm. And what did you find? So in particular on HIV and AIDS, I mean, one of the, the key things was that, that, um, that the, the policy of the government at the time uh, this is a conservative government, remember, under Margaret Thatcher in the late 80s, was a policy which did not uh, um, follow what you would expect from a conservative government. They didn't take a kind of moralistic approach to HIV and AIDS. And the reason for that was that do the doctors who were seeing people with HIV and AIDS were, were insisting that they adopt a, pro a, a policy which, which focused on saving the people rather than being moralistic about the people who are, who might be uh, affected by it, so it was it showed that uh, that actually that um, that uh, public campaigning on uh, on an issue like that could be effective even in the teeth of opposition from something like a conservative government. Where in the case of uh, of the health minister at the time, who, who was unable to to use words for parts of the sexual anatomy because he was embarrassed about it, and nevertheless, it was possible to to push the government into uh, uh, an approach which was not uh, conservative and moralistic. Interesting. In, in terms of the Israel lobby, that period of time when Thatcher was in government, <clears throat> you actually saw something happen which is inconceivable today in terms of the British government taking a step that would upset the Israel lobby. What was it that happened during the Thatcher years that... Um, you would uh, love to see today. Well, I mean, it, it. What we have to understand is that from the very beginning of the creation of the state of Israel, the intelligence services associated with that state, uh, most obviously the Mossad, and prior to the creation of the state of Israel, its predecessor, have been targeting um, Britain and indeed, of course, the US, and have been. Uh, in the words of an MI5 file from the early 1950s, have been a, Israel has been a hostile state. Uh, in, in that case, in, in, which you can see, anyone can see on the declassified MI5 files on the uh, the, uh, web, the British government's um, website of the Public Records Office, there was a, 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 sp a Mossad spy very high up in British intelligence in the Joint Intelligence Committee, its, its successor, its uh, predecessor. And this person was discovered by MI5, and they removed this person. Um, what was their name? I, I forget the name of the mm -hmm. person, but uh, but they, as a result, the MI5 officer in charge of writing up the case file said, "Now we understand that Israel is a hostile state, hostile foreign state," and that, of course, is what's been the case ever since. And it's only been in though in periodic uh, times when when uh, uh, the Zionists have overstepped. That the British government has taken direct action against them. Now, in the case that you're talking about, um, it, there was an assassination in, in, uh, of, uh, of uh, a Palestinian, uh, uh, who was a cartoonist, of course, and uh, um, in Knightsbridge, and he was assassinated by two Palestinians, uh, and it turned out that the Palestinians were agents of Mossad, and that the they were being run. Um, by the Mossad station in London, and Thatcher was furious at this. Right, that they were they would engage in this kind of activity in London, and she shut down the Mossad station and she expelled not just the person who was running them, but I think several, I think it was three, two or three of the the uh, the Mossad uh, personnel in London. Now that's not the only time that's happened. There's, there's been other times where it's happened as well. If you remember the the that famous footage in Dubai. Of the, uh, the the Mossad people in tennis gear going, yeah. up, going up in the lift to assassinate a Hamas commander. Now, in that oh, in that case, mm. um, they had used pirated British passports. Yeah, and as a result, they uh, they were expulsions by I think by the Labour government. Yeah. Uh, so so it's not impossible for the for the British government to both conceive of and take action against 
uh, Mossad actions, but it's, it is extremely rare for that to happen. I think also the problem is, is that you've got so many different angles from which Israel works to try and subjugate a target. So, you know, the, the British uh, state is quite heavily, seemingly, uh, penetrated by what seem to be uh, Israel data grabs, one could say. You know, for instance, you look at the uh, organization which handles the, uh, the cloud services of the Ministry of Defense, the Home Office, um, even the NHS, Oracle. Essentially, this is an extension of, firstly, U.S. Uh, uh, intelligence. It was set up, Oracle, to service the CIA. Interestingly, <clears throat> interestingly enough, Larry Ellison, who's believed to be the fourth to seventh richest man in the world, actually loaned a billion dollars to Elon Musk to to buy Twitter. As you do, as you do, and he, you know, Larry Ellison, such a close friend of Netanyahu that he offered Netanyahu the directorship of Oracle. You now have uh, Safra Katz, who is the uh, the CEO of uh, Oracle, and she's even said when asked about it that if employees have a problem with Oracle being so close to the Israeli government, then they need to find another company to work for. Yeah, um, and and to think that that company has access to key data for these important um, institutions within the British state. You know, we are talking about. Um, a situation of, of, of national security here, a crisis of national um, security. Of course, you have other examples like Nice Systems. Um, interestingly, <clears throat> Nice Systems works on facial recognition within CCTV cameras, and it also has software which uh, different police forces in Britain use um, uh, in their investigations. And Nice Systems is. An Israeli company, yes, started by alumni of Unit 8200, yes. Also, which is an Israeli intelligence organization. Yeah, the equivalent of GCHQ. Yeah. That, that organization, Nice Systems, formerly was headed previously by Haim Shani. So Haim Shani can head Nice Systems at the same time as heading something called the UK Israel Tech Hub, which is an organization that is based in the British Embassy in occupied Palestine, but the British Embassy for Israel. Um, he heads this organization. It is uh, staffed by former Israeli military personnel. It's staffed by uh, former Israeli intelligence personnel. It's funded by the British government, so it's funded by the British Foreign Office, it's funded by the British Department of Trade, and it exists for the core purpose of obtaining public contracts in Britain for Israeli tech companies. companies. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is not only is Haim Shani the head of the UK Israel Tech Hub, he was the head of Nice System, he's also the head of one of the directors of Celebrite. And Celebrite has the contracts with the British um, security services to hack people's phones, probably ours. Sure. So what we're talking about is the sort of anatomy, the anatomy of total state penetration. In a way, you've got the ultra visible aspects of the Israel lobby, which we see, which are the sort of attack yeah. attackers, really, who, who work in the media sphere. They, they, they work on uh, disfiguring public perceptions of uh, people that are critical critical, and also believe in Palestinian liberation. Yeah. So they're the public face of it. But what happens in terms of the data, what happens in terms of the attempts to subjugate key state apparatus is, um, is quite extraordinary, actually, because I can't think of another state, you know, you look at what happened with Huawei, and the 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 sure. the real um, just constant panic, moral panic that was swept up about Huawei, and you compare it, nobody 
is interested in these aspects. Well, you could, I mean, yeah, of course, but uh, that's Ch China is an enemy state. But e even if we, but is it or is it not? I mean, well, it's also the top trading part. Sure, that's that's the mad thing. You come that, out that, of Brexit it, no, and it, it goes it, from it, Germany it, being the top trading is, part to is, China being the top. It is bad, but yeah. but it's, at the same time, but I mean, I think people just think, oh well, it's, you're you're obsessed with Israel, right? But then you 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 ask people, well, so so is there a Tunisian <laughs> British tech hub? Is there an Algerian British tech well, hub? Well, I tell you what, there is. I tell you what, there is, David. <laughs> there is a Nigerian one, um, and there is one or two other states. They have nothing yeah. in comparison to the UK Israel tech hub. I'm talking about staff. I'm talking about personnel. I'm talking I'm, about sure. funding. I'm yeah. talking about visibility. I'm talking about activity, yeah. and they actually do completely different things. Sure. So the Nigeria tech hub trains. Nigerians in tech. There's no Nigerian companies vying for British contracts. No, yeah. I mean there, there we are. That that's the distinction, right? And and this, this is an actual issue, and and this is something which actually the British intelligence services do recognise in principle as an issue, as as was seen in the case of British Telecom, where this uh, Zionist billionaire, French Zionist billionaire Patrick Drahi, uh, took over a large chunk of. British Telecom, and, and there was an investigation on grounds of national security, yep. right? which, of course, was uh, was about the potential conflict of interest that he had as a Zionist. Uh, now, so they recognise that this is an issue at some level, well, but they're not willing to follow through and to do anything about it. But I mean, the interesting thing about Patrick Drahi is I twenty four, the Israeli channel that he runs, was by former employees described as a mouthpiece of Netanyahu. Sure. Patrick Dre, he would literally have Netanyahu's son give him a call. And according to testimony from former employees, it would lead to a change in coverage of who could and couldn't be on the shows there. He also owns a, a channel in France, a news channel that has been um, uh, accused of censoring, well, has actually censored pro-Palestinian uh, voices. Yeah. He, of course, owns other telecom companies within occupied Palestine. Um, and, you know, for instance, the, the magazine in France of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, Liberation, he bought it yeah. and put a former... Um, Israeli intelligence person. As, as the editor. That's right. And so, like you say, yes, there was an investigation on the basis of national security when he increased his share to over 18%, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. But he, he was also given a clean bill of health. That's right. So what we're talking about is so many ways in which, in a way, the sort of public politics aspect of what Israel has done is something that has been inescapable for people. People know it. You know, people know it. But as we're talking about here, it's just one aspect of what has been sure. done. So, so what happens is that is that um, Zionists are sort of distributed, not not saying this is done deliberately, because they haven't got the power to do that, but, mm. but they're distributed throughout the, the po political system, the economic system, the cultural sphere. And so that when, it, when it, any issue comes up, you know, ideally from their point of view, they want to play both ends of the game. So when it's the case that someone wants uh, someone removed from social media, they have a parliamentary committee to demand that there is a person X, in the case I wrote about a guy called Leith Maruth from Canada, and this committee, it's an inter-parliamentary inter committee, that demands that Twitter shuts down this guy's account, right? Oh, oh, um, oh that's the Canadian parliament yeah, 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 that, yeah. that just honoured um, right. an actual very, Nazi very soldier. So, so, they ha so they have a, a parliamentary mm. committee which, which demands someone's uh, social media is removed, and then Twitter, before Elon Musk takes over, goes to its panel of, uh, of people to decide on these things. Mm. And its panel, of course, is made up of Zionist organizations. You know, no Palestinian organizations, no pro-Palestinian organizations. And so they, they but play, who presumably they, didn't spot a 98-year-old Nazi sneaking they into presu Canadian presumably didn't. And they, so they play both ends of the game, and this is, this is how it works, you know, that, that uh, there, there are so many people in the, in the, the political elite who, who are of Zionist sympathies that they are able to control. Uh, many decisions, where, and and pe people who have contrary views, who support the Palestinians, have got no way of making making an influence on those ideas. Yeah, I mean the interesting thing about the Oracle case, obviously, is that at the time when Larry Ellison 
was vying for the Oracle contract, which is massive, by the way. You know, we're talking about humongous contract, which just passes under the radar. You know, we have such a shockingly sort of almost illiterate culture of investigation yeah, so he, in this country. So Larry Ellison set up a, a foundation in this country to donate money to scientific research. And Tony Blair. <laughs> yes. And Tony Blair. And, uh, and he also he po he pointed to this uh, the foundation, this guy who'd written his biography. And you, you remember who the guy was, right? It's, who was he? It, it was uh, uh, Boris Johnson's wife's father. Yes. <laughs> yes. The father-in-law <laughs> of the prime minister. That's right. And this, this foundation, of course, was shut, mysteriously shut down very abruptly once the contract was won. Yeah, you know, big surprise. <laughs> yeah, and that's how it works. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's astonishing that we have people in this country that call themselves journalists that haven't looked at any of this. No stuff. one will look at it. Because these are scandalous conflicts yeah. of interest which have direct ramifications for the integrity, the integrity of this thing that you imagine to be sovereignty. You don't have sovereignty no. in uh, this country, you know, and that's aside from 12,000 US soldiers on military bases all over the country. That is in terms of what um, Israel is doing. Unfortunately, we have uh, come to the end of the show, but I would encourage everybody watching this to contribute to uh, David's crowdfunder for his upcoming uh you know big day or big days in 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 court when we're going to see this uh this case reach a point where potentially an important precedent can be established to defend anti-zionism so you need to tell people where this uh crowdfunder can be reached tell them and that is fightingfund.org fighting fund Dot org. Contribute now and help David achieve a really important victory for other anti-Zionists in uh, in the uh, in universities in this country. They need all the help they can get at the moment to push back. Thank you. Please support us here at Mint Press. Also, um, as you know, we are also besieged in several different ways too. So thank you for watching. See you next time.